Hello and welcome to session two for this week's class of communication law, ethics, and diversity. We have officially left behind the legal aspects of this course in terms of the modules, and we are now entering the ethical philosophies, or I would say the ethics modules of Com Law, Ethics, and Diversity. And so today we're going to be talking about the ethical philosophies and some of the very early scholars behind ethical philosophy. So, among those very early scholars that we'll talk about are Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill, William David Ross, and some others that may be familiar to you as we go through the slides together. Now, as a starting point, contemporary philosopher Cecilia Bach that mode of ethical decision making is very instructive for us to read. And so if most of you have gotten the text that is required for this course, you will see work coming from Cecilia Buck's model of ethical decision making. And so in Cecilia Buck's work, you will see that the basic ethical tenets of six historical schools of thought are also critical as they might be applicable to modern situations we may find ourselves in from time to time. Now, Bach's model is based on two premises. One is that we should have empathy for the people involved in ethical decision making. And two, we should maintain social trust as a fundamental goal. In other words, all of us should think about the other person who is involved in the, in the decision making process, whether it's the journalist or the public relations practitioner, or even somebody who's a workmate. And of course, social trust is a fundamental goal within that whole process of empathy. And so by definition, empathy really is that feeling or understanding what someone else is feeling rather than just thinking about how you're feeling as an individual. And it's lending that helping hand to that person. It's not just sympathy, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, but it's how can I help you in your current situation, in your human condition? And so Bach has a three-step analysis that is offered to us, really for us to understand exactly how ethics should permeate our lives. And so keeping these two ideas in mind, Bach says that any ethical dilemma should be analyzed using three steps. First, Bach recommends that we consult our conscience about the correctness of an action. So we ask ourselves, is this action right? How do I feel if I go left or if I go right? If I do that, how is it going to impact the other person? And so in the context of news making, a journalist may apply this particular first level of consciousness to ask themselves, how do I feel about actually defaming someone or writing a story that is not known to have three sources? Because we know you're supposed to have three sources when it comes to news making. They say when in doubt, find out or leave out. So Bach suggests that we actually consult our own conscious, conscience about the correctness of, of an action, correctness of an action. The second step Bach proposes is that we seek the advice of experts for a possible alternative action. So step number two, seek the advice of experts outside of our own conscience. And so this really has to do with, if you were a journalist, why don't you seek the advice of an editor or somebody who's working in the same profession, but who's more seasoned than you are um, making that particular decision? Ask the question, is there another way to achieve the same goal without raising ethical concerns? Um, were I to reveal the, the names of my sources, am I breaking trust, so to speak? So asking the question of someone who's an expert who's gone down that particular pathway, it's going to be a very good ethical move to make, according to Buck, at the very second level of analysis before you actually engage in the moral act or the ethical act. The third step that Buck actually proposes is that if possible, we should be conducting a discussion with the parties involved in the dispute. So we're, we're juxtaposed supposing that there are going to be three parties involved and we're asking ourselves, you know, so what have you done and how are you going to actually resolve this conflict? And then, of course, asking the third party, what do you think is the root cause of the issue? 
So it's this whole notion of having this conference or having a discussion in terms of, you know, what are our alternative, you know, um, dispute resolution types of actions that we should actually be taking within the, 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 the current situation. If they cannot be gathered, Buck is suggesting that we try to conduct the conversation hypothetically asking how will others actually respond to the proposed act? So if there is a dispute, ask yourself, Buck is suggesting, how will others actually respond? So it's having that voice or that particular hypothetical consciousness, drawing that map, putting the protagonist and the antagonist and the person who's in the middle there as the dispute um, resolution individual to find out exactly what particular move to make in the game of chess when it comes to that ethical decision making that has to be made. So how will others respond to the proposed act? Is it likely to escalate the situation? Is it likely to deflate the situation? So these are the three steps that Buck is suggesting that we actually consider in terms of ethical decision making. Now, in your text, you will find that Buck's model is actually there to address, address an ethical dilemma involving the United Way. So I'd like for you to make sure that you're reading to understand exactly how Buck applied the ethical model or using the three-step approach for, for that particular issue to be resolved based on that particular um, way in which she sees issues being resolved. Now, we engage the ethical philosopher starting out with Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher who had several core beliefs just like the others who will follow. And his core beliefs really centered on happiness. For Aristotle, happiness was the ultimate human good that we should all strive for and that our primary goal was to exercise practical reason in our daily activities. So everything that we do should really center around our happiness. And for him, the focus was the actor as a person. You're focusing on ourselves, you're focusing on yourself rather than what you're actually doing. So happiness is really about who you are and how you're embodying your environment and everything that makes you happy. And for Aristotle, virtue really comes from having a very strong character. So we can see that Aristotle really focuses on the self, on that particular individual and their source of happiness. He felt that the golden mean is where, you know, we should actually be centered. And of course, somewhere in the center there, virtue lies in between, all right? So for him, virtue was not at the two extremes, but somewhere in between. So you may not be an excellent person, you may not be a bad person, but you may be just right. So that was what he felt that we should really be striving for in the context of happiness um, in, 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 in place of this whole notion of, you know, ethical thinking and morality and stuff like that. Um, for Aristotle, you know, if we were to apply his thought processes to modern media issues, we can see that in federal governments, um, you know, decision making is actually around this whole notion of how can we not offend the left or how can we not offend the right. So let's just take a central role in this whole process and applying this to how they regulate the tobacco industry, advertising, um, in, you know, to be exact, you will see that instead of them banning all the advertising or deciding not to regulate the advertising, they decided to have some sort of middle ground in the context of just really having some warning labels. So they banned the ads from the television and required that warning labels be included in the print ads and of course on cigarette boxes. So this is where you will find that those particular warnings coming from the Federal Trade Commission in terms of what is bad for your health and what's not, or it is not really something that is you know, promoted by them. This is not necessarily our ideal. Um, this is really this, this way of indemnifying yourself from falling out um, with persons on the left or on the right. And I'm not talking about on the left or on the right in the political context of being liberal or conservative, but I'm talking about those persons that maybe took both sides in terms of two different extremes. They want to take a middle ground so that according to Aristotle, it is always striving to find that middle ground where you are neutral as the party looking on at both sides of the coin. Now we come to Kant. Now Kant was an 18th century German philosopher and really he took an opposite side of what um, you know, Aristotle posited. 
he said that we should focus on the act and not the actor. His core beliefs really resided in benevolence and truth telling as the absolute. He's known for the categorical imperative, which states that you should act on the maxim that you would not want to become a universal law. All right, so it's based on a principle. So tell the truth at all times. Under the system, you don't consider any situational factors or possible consequences. You just strive to tell the truth at all times. All right, so for Kant's categorical imperative, to be applied to what we're seeing in media issues, a journalist should not lie or invade someone's privacy to get a story. They should not engage in deception if they're advertisers. If you're trying to sell a product, it is very, very wrong to actually say that we can have a result coming out in one week or two days, moving from a size 12 to a size six. That's just an example. There should be no lying whatsoever about what the product or service can actually do for the consumer. And so for Kant, dishonesty in public relations is never right, even if telling the truth hurts the company's reputation, all right? So if you're telling the truth about a company in terms of, well, some of the products are malfunctioning, for Kant, you need to say what is the truth so that consumers can be warned in advance because that's his categorical imperative. Tell the truth and let whatever happen, happen. Let the chips fall where they may, according to Kant's categorical imperative. Next, we go to John, John Stuart Mill, the 19th century British philosopher, whose core beliefs are not necessarily the same as Kant's or as I would say Aristotle. He said that preventing pain and promoting pleasure are the main ethical goals of humankind. And the focus is not on the actor, neither is the, the focus on the action, but instead on the consequences of the action. And of course, he's best known for the principle of utility. He's what you call a utilitarian, all right? It's an ethical action that should seek the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. So if you're not happy or your grandma's not happy or your father's not happy for, for, for Stuart Mill, that is besides the point, that is inconsequential. If it makes the entire community happy, then it's good because really for him, it's about the principle of utility or utilitarianism, meaning if the greater good is served, then who cares about who else is actually unhappy? So it's about really finding that pleasure in within the, the main, as your main ethical goal. Now, his ideas can also be applied to questions about whether a journalist can under, go undercover. Um, we know that Kant will say no to that in terms of his categorical categorical imperative, do not lie, do not use the types of strategies and tactics that are um, illegal, um, that are really bordering on unethical practices in terms of a breach of privacy. For John Stuart Mill, he's suggesting that, you know, it's acceptable to lie to get a story if it results in the greater good for society. In other words, if the story is actually uncovering the issue of what is happening to people who are, um, you know, in, in incarcerated, and of course it's, it's helping an entire community or society, then so be it. We need to make sure that it's for the greater good of society. If it is that some persons are misdiagnosed or you have a situation like what happened with Nellie Bly, when she discovered that they were actually treating or ill-treating persons who were in the asylum, in the mental asylum in a bad way, then for him it's about uncovering atrocities and that is all good because it's helping the larger society understand and policymakers whose attention the story will come to, it will help them to change the situation. For him, the more people who are helped out in the situation, the better in terms of uncovering the information. Then if you were to leave it there, um, it's better somebody is actually, um, you know, you know, told what is happening than people who are heard by the light to get the information. So it for him, it's like if the CEO is upset about it, um, that's inconsequential. If a whole lot of people who have family members who are affected by what is happening inside of that institution, that is exactly what should happen in this particular context in terms of Mill's ethical philosophy and his principle of utility. So the greater good is larger or more important than the good of one individual, all right? Now we come to William David Ross and he's a 20th century American philosopher 
And he had a couple of core beliefs as well. And his core beliefs really were centered around, you know, the fact that there is often more than one ethical value to be considered in a situation. He differs somewhat from the other philosophers um, because, you know, there is this whole belief that there is only one ultimate value. And for him, his focus is on the actor rather than the act. And of course, that is what he felt from the primacy of the community. He's best known for the pluralistic theory of value or value theory. And he felt that we have competing values. In other words, there's no one value that ties us to an ethical concern or ties us to an ethical decision that we would make in our lives. These values, Ross calls duties, or he called them duties, include one, fidelity, followed by reparation, gratitude, justice, beneficent, um, you know, self-improvement, prevention, veracity, and nurture. Now, to choose among these duties, he, he argues that we must consider the level of commitment we have to each of them in various circumstances. Now, it just depends on who we are at that time. For him, it's a matter of, well, am I really applying the fidelity value when I try to tell a lie about the company that I'm working with because I want to save face as the public relations officer of that company. So for me at that time, it's about me having a greater fidelity or loyalty to the company. If I were a reporter, do I have a fidelity to what I'm doing as a job or do I have some sort of, um, I would say justice that I'd like to bring out in the story as a result of the implications of that issue that I'm investigating. So a moral act for Rojas really is one that will allow you to be faithful to the most important duties if you're choosing among all of these values. This idea really works well for media professionals who have to balance competing roles every single day. And an example here is that of a public relations officer um, who wants to tell the truth about the company um, but also wants to minimize harm at the same time to his or her employer. And that person will be called upon to weigh the competing duties when faced with a news reporter who's asking about the company scandal. So here it is that that person has to weigh whether I should talk about the scandal, that's the truth, or whether I should actually minimize harm in terms of my own sense of gratitude or fidelity to the company. So these are all different ideals, different values that journalists, public relations practitioners, those who are working in a media platforms, on media platforms, those who are advertisers, they have to think about how do I actually apply these values to my profession? And these are the things that I'd like you to start to think about as you consider your own ethical standpoint um, that will be for submission later on in the semester. What are some of the values that you would like, you know, you know, address or you'd like to apply to your own professional development as you go out into the world of work um, as, as PR or media practitioners? Now, this is a more contemporary philosopher, a little dated but still contemporary, John Rawls. And he had a couple of core beliefs as well. And he said that queerness is the fundamental aspect of ethics. So he was more about fairness. And so he advocated for the veil of ignorance. Now, you would recall that in our very early um, sessions, earlier sessions, I spoke about the different types of figures who were um, entitled to and should expect some level of privacy, a modicum of privacy. Now, for Rawls, he felt that not because you're a public figure, you should be more important in terms of how you're valued or you're privileged in the news than somebody who is just an accidental figure or an incidental figure, you know. So somebody who's actually there in the public domain for Rawls should not be treated any better in coverage in the news than somebody who's not necessarily in the public domain. So all parties for him should be treated the same regardless of class or station in life. And we know this is the ideal but this does not necessarily happen. So the veil of ignorance is not necessarily applied in the context of news coverage because you will find that people will go into communities and they will cover all the spokespersons or somebody who's actually from that community who's well known. 
or even if there's an issue involving somebody who's an actor, they will get much more coverage than somebody who's just regular Tom or Jane in the streets. And so for roles, the distribution of everything in this life should be equal unless an unequal distribution would benefit the least advantaged party in life. So if we were to apply his particular argument to taxes, he would say, you know what, tax the wealthy and make sure that you're giving more stimulus packages to those who are not necessarily advantaged in life. All right. So it's this whole notion of having equal treatment meted out to every single person in society. So if we look at this in the context of news and entertainment and the treatment of people, um, it is not the same, all right? It should be, but it's not the same. It should be the same regardless of whether the person is rich and famous or poor and unknown to those of us in society. Now let's look at some other concepts around the ethical philosophies, starting with communitarianism. And we know that we spoke about some of the philosophers who felt that the greater good is something that we should be striving for. And so communitarianism is not associated with a single individual. It does not privilege or value self. It is all about social justice. It's not about if you're happy or if it pleases you to do it. It is about thinking about how am I going to improve the livelihood or the lives of those who are around me. It departs from this whole notion of, well, you know, strive for excellence, this, you, you can actually live the dream out. And once you do what you're supposed to do, you'll get there. Every person for himself. It is not about the individual focus. It's about the larger community or society. How can we help each other out in society? And you will find that uh, there are cultures that are different. Western cultures really emphasizes the individual. But even within Western cultures, there are families who actually um, share and insist on, 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 on those family members thinking about the brother, thinking about the sister, thinking about those who are working in the office. So even though this may be an individualistic, as is described, Western individualistic culture, there are some subcultures or there are some families or there are some people who do not necessarily subscribe to this type of focus. But largely speaking, it is about the individual striving for him or herself to, be, to make it big in, in life, all right, to become a success. So civic journalism really plays a deep role in communitarianism in the sense that newspapers and TV news that is designed to help a community rather than just reporting on what is wrong within a community engages in civic journalism. So for those of you who do watch news, you will notice that, let's say you're watching ABC or NBC News, sometimes there's a segment called Making a Difference or there is a segment called America Strong, whatever the focus is, in some cases, you will find that there is a need. Let's say there's a water shortage or there's some sort of contamination or something happening in a community, perhaps the children lack a playground, all right? Rather than focus on the fact that, oh my goodness, quite a few gangs have sprung up in the community or quite a few young people are going astray. What the news anchor or what the producer will focus on is what is lacking in the society, in that community that is causing them to turn in that direction. So rather than saying, well, this is the reason and this is why we have so much crime, they draw the attention of the audience members to the fact that there is a need. And if that need is met, better can come to the youth in that society. So that's what we call the practice of civic journalism in highlighting what needs can be met in the community so that life can be better for those people rather than saying, this is just about black on black crime or this is just about gang violence happening Rather than actually doing that, they're saying, these are some of the needs that have been expressed by the people. And so what has happened as a result of civic journalism is that as soon as that particular broadcast is aired, you will find people coming forward to say, I'd like to donate to that community to give back to that particular group of people. Or I'd like the young people there to actually have a place to go hang out, you know, some sort of club or whatever it is. So the visibility that is actually given to that issue redounds or results in change for the betterment of that community. So what a community needs to improve itself is what we're actually seeing rather than, a, you know, just this is what the news is all about. So this favors really a more public relations type of role for journalism. So that's what communitarianism is all about. It's about meeting the needs of the people, not necessarily sometimes in a tangible way, but in a way that says this is the issue 
And these are the ways in which you can actually help that community. Now we come to Confucius, Locke, and Nietzsche. Now Confucius was a man ahead of his time and he felt that the golden rule is what we should all strive for. And this is not to be confused with the golden mean. The golden rule is this whole notion of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Most of you may know that, all right? It has some sort of biblical basis, but for Confucius, it's this whole notion of, you know what? Since you yourself desire standing, then help others to achieve it, all right? Because your success will be built upon helping others as well. What you do not wish for yourself, do not do to others. So it's this whole notion of always think about the other person. It is not very far removed from this whole idea of empathy, beyond sympathy, but just actually making sure that you are there for others as well. Um, and so for Confucius, the golden rule is more similar to Kant's categorical imperative. Don't tell a lie than Aristotle's golden mean, which is, I will just be in the middle there, all right? His social philosophy largely revolves around the concept of ren or compassion or love for others, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is actually saying that we should be sure to avoid saying things in a manner that would create a false impression and lead to self-aggrandizement. Now, if I were to go back to some sort of biblical idea behind this particular perception or this particular position that was put forward by Confucius, it's this whole idea that you, you should never let your left hand know what your right hand is doing or something like that I would hear people saying. It's about not making your arms known before men. Oh, you know, Jesus had an issue with that. I feed the poor and I give to the, to, 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 to the homeless and I whatever it is. No, it's about really not expressing that pride so outrightly that the whole world has to know what you give. It is about being humble about the goodness that you have and the compassion you have for others, all right? So for him, those of us who have cult cultivated Ren are, on the contrary, simple in manner and slow of speech. It's not about telling everybody on Facebook, I've just fed every single person at that particular orphanage. That's what I did for my birthday. Um, for him, that should not be something that should be made public. It should be kept as low as possible so that, I guess, you don't do your arms before men, but you make sure that, you know, somebody is noting it, somebody, whoever you believe that person to be, is actually making a note of your good works. Now, John Locke really felt that true happiness as a philosopher, he felt that true happiness is associated with the good, which in turn is associated with pleasure. Again, we hear the word pleasure. Pleasure in its turn is taken by Locke to be the sole motive for human action. So if it's pleasurable, why not do it? Like Nike says, just do it. And so his core beliefs really is the fact that we are governed by natural law, which supersedes other laws such as religion. And according to Locke, everyone has three natural rights of life, liberty, and estate. So we have life or liberty, and of course, land or right or estate. Sounds like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So though these are his core, these are the three natural rights that we have. But he also felt that everyone is also entitled to live, to be free to do whatever they want to do, as long as it does not violate the first law or killing people. And of course, to own property, as long as we don't try to, you know, do something that is outside of the norm in terms of getting the, 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 the right to the property and stuff like that. So following religious law, that is the Bible, he says it's fine as long as it doesn't violate natural law. Now, while Locke was a Christian, he wouldn't be cool with the Crusades or with killing homosexuals because he was totally against how he saw things unfolding in the context of Christian beliefs and how it is that people interacted with each other or persons who are not necessarily of their religious persuasion. So for him, enforcing natural law should be convenient, hence rewards and punishments should be associated with the respect or violation of these particular natural laws. Now, Nietzsche, he was famous for his attack on moral philosophy, but he was not a critic of all morality. And this is how he differed from what we were seeing here in the context of what Locke was saying. He explicitly embraces, for instance, the idea of a higher morality, which would inform the lives of higher men. So right there, we see he's talking about those priests, right? those persons who had direct contact with God. They were the intermediaries. But his problem with religion really was the fact that Christianity 
um, you know, was far from the teachings of Jesus, you know, the person being Jesus who came and stuff like that. His argument is that, you know, you forcing people to believe in Jesus, but you're not acting like him. Um, if you're saying that homosexuals should die, or if you're saying that people who don't necessarily believe are destined for the lake of fire, I don't think that Jesus would have actually judged them that way, but he would have actually shared whatever it is in love or something like that. So his his idea is that we are really not necessarily true followers of Christ. For those persons who believe, um, it's a, a matter of hypocrisy for him. All right. So Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's morality in a pejorative sense, you know, it, it really applies only moral views that assume human beings have, number one, free will, number two, that they can understand and run their motivations, and three, morality has universal applicability. Now, if I were to think about or consider what he is talking about um, in the context of free will, um, uh, humans being able to understand and run their motivations and morality, his argument is this, if we were to call or deem um, you know, homosexuality immoral, it, it presumes that people aren't necessarily molested or abused. It presumes that you know, they have free will to choose to live that lifestyle. And so I can see him arguing for those persons who believe that somebody has the proclivity, not by choice, but as a result of what has happened to them in the past. So it is really psychologically determined or it's as a result of their socialization, not by choice or free will. Um, I can see the argument being applied as well to issues around um, commercial sex workers, persons who are forced into sex slave um, types of lifestyles or labor um, through human trafficking, all right? They don't have free will to do that because this is coercion and this is this whole notion of I'm promising you a better life, but when you get to the other side, you're actually forced into selling um, your body, commercial sex work. So, excuse me, free will is not necessarily present for that person. So to assign damnation to someone who is a commercial sex worker, who is actually in that slave trade, um, it is not you know, something that Jesus would do. Mitch would probably say, well, he would probably try to free the person and tell him, go your way and sin no more. So it's about this whole notion of understanding and putting yourself in the person's shoes when it comes to actually judging their particular morality, all right? So morality for him has universal applicability and stuff like that. And there are also other schools of thought apart from Nietzsche and the others that I've shared with you in the context of the types of thinking and philosophies when it comes to our moralities. So those are the major, major um, ones that I'd like to share with you. And I'd like for you to think about or probably just, um, you know, check up and see exactly what exists out there in terms of the very early ethical philosophies. Um, there is a video here. If you cannot actually access the video, that is also fine. But I'd like for you to think about making a concept map. And again, please make sure that you're reading the text ahead of our sessions. And I wish you all the best in terms of reading as we prep for the mid-semester um, quiz. So I'll leave you right here for now. And um, we meet again through my next live lecture. Well, I would say recorded lecture um, as we continue to look at uh, the ethics of the whole class for this semester.